Welcome to First Reading, the most patriotic preaching podcast out there. I'm Rachel Wren. And I'm Tim McNinch. So is that a uh, 4th of July reference? What? Is it a little too heavy handed? Too much? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. But either way, we're glad that you're listening. And yes, we are this week bringing you preaching tips for July 4th, 2021, which is on 2 Samuel 5, 1 through 5 and 9 to 10. Rachel's been studying the text this week. So what do you have for us, Rachel? Well, this is a really interesting text. It's about the establishment of Jerusalem as the stronghold of David. Sort of. Mm. I want to have a conversation about this text, the kind of exegesis of this text in particular, but I want to have a broader conversation then about what we might call the reception history of the text. Um, Reception history just means the ways that different communities throughout the centuries have read and interpreted and used these texts. We say the way they have received them. But it's the very recent reception history of this text that I'm interested in. And and I'll say more about that in a bit. All right. So it sounds kind of like you've got two ways into this text, one that's about kind of what's going on in the the text itself, and then one in the reception history behind it or in front of it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So where do you want to go first? Okay. Well, first, I'd just like to orient us in the text, just do some basic exegesis to contextualize what we're talking about here. So this chapter of the Bible comes from the book of 2 Samuel, and we've been talking about 1 and 2 Samuel a lot these last few weeks, but for our larger literary purposes, it's helpful to keep in mind what these books are all about, because if you're not super familiar with them, they just kind of sound like Bible books. Uh, So I wanted to give us a more modern um, analogy for what's going on in these books. Tim, you've heard of the show The Game of Thrones, right? I have to say I have heard of it, but I have never watched it. Okay, right. So big HBO series from about five-ish years ago based on a book series by the same name. I read the first couple of books of the series, but the author kept killing my favorite characters. (laughs) I was just like, forget it. I don't need this kind of grief in my life. (laughs) But for some perspective, this is sort of what the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel are all about. 1 Samuel especially is a contest for the throne of Israel, and you might call it the game of Israel's throne. Mm. There's, there's, there's less sex, but about the same amount of bloodshed, so HBO might make it into a miniseries someday. Plenty of sex too, though. Beyond that, I mean, there's plenty of that too. We just don't get those in the lectionary reading. <laughs> before it was a kingdom, however, Israel was a nation. And before it was a nation, it was a loose group of tribes. So think Joshua and Judges, Exodus, Deuteronomy. And before it was a group of tribes, it was just one family. It was the family of a man named Israel or Jacob. So part of this section of the Bible is the story of the development of this one family from a nuclear group to a tribe, to a nation, to a kingdom. And in fact, Tim, a few weeks ago, you did a nice exegesis on the moment when the nation switches from nation to kingdom in 1 Samuel 7. Mm, Right. God's heartbreak moment is at Mm -hmm. least as it's portrayed in that text. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that's something that you lifted up in your exegesis, that the Bible is of two minds when it comes to kings. One strand sees kings as something really positive as representatives of God on earth who can unify a people and keep them oriented towards Adonai. But a second strand sees them as just kind of crap sandwiches, to put it bluntly. (laughs) They're they're just like trouble from the start, trouble in the middle, and trouble all the way to the collapse of the monarchy. That's a sandwich I'm going to stay away from. (laughs) (laughs) But you know... When you look at it, like both strands of thought can can be kind of right. Yeah, yeah, completely. And we actually get a pretty good example of that in our text for today. So just to orient us, leading up to this text is sort of the wind down of the game of Israelite thrones, the, the contest between King Saul and his sons and David. Second Samuel 3, two chapters before this one, begins with the statement, The war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. 
So Saul and his son Jonathan died back in 1 Samuel 31. Since then, David has been consolidating power, and he's even been anointed king of one of the tribes of Judah. Mm, uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Right, exactly. Though David's head doesn't get uneasy until later in the story. <laughs> At this point, he's like the picture of the conquering king. All of the tribes of Israel flock to David at Hebron, a city south of Jerusalem. Now, interestingly, Hebron is also where Sarah, who was married to Abraham, died and was buried. And it was also the place that was given to Caleb, Moses' favorite spy, for strength and resilience in following God. So it was a good place that had some pretty monumental attachments in the Israelite consciousness. There is where the tribes came to David, and there they crowned him king. And then we skip over to verses 9 through 10, where we hear that David founded the city of David, Jerusalem. So far, so good, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much sounds like a basic crowning story. Exactly. And if we stayed with the first five verses of 2 Samuel 5, and then jump to verses 9 to 10, it would be. The interesting part, however, the really fascinating part of this story is what gets left out in the Revised Common Lectionary. Surprise, surprise. Right. So verse 5 is this little note that tells us how long David reigned in Hebron and at Jerusalem. And then verse 6 picks up with the story of how David came to conquer Jerusalem. Yeah, friends, you heard that right. The city that's called the city of David, it wasn't called the city of David because David founded it. It's because he conquered it. Jerusalem was founded by followers of a Canaanite deity. The, the scholarly hypothesis, as it's put forth in the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, is that the name Jerusalem, or Yerushalayim, is a combination of the words Yara, meaning foundation, and Shalem, who was a Canaanite deity. So the name Jerusalem actually means foundation of the god Shalem. It has nothing to do with Adonai. It, it, it took me a while to really absorb that the first time I learned it. The city of David, Zion, the Mount of the Living God, is named after someone else. Yeah, I remember coming across the word Jerusalem and thinking, now wait a minute, what yeah. does that actually mean? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I at first thought it was like city of peace. Yeah, right. Shalom. Shalom. Yeah. Yeah, but it turns out that a lot of these cities are named after deities sort of honored in the founding of the city. Bethlehem's yeah. another one. Wait, Bethlehem? I thought that was House of Bread, Bethlehem. Yeah, you'd think so, but Lechem was a Canaanite deity. No way. Bet Shemesh, House of Shem Shamash. Yeah, I knew that one, but Bethlehem, dang, I gotta go back and redo my Hebrew lecture on that. Anyway, this passage, 2 Samuel 5, is a story about conquering. And it's been left out of our communal storytelling about our religion. Mm. That happens in conquering societies all the time. So the question becomes, what does it say about us if we leave this little note out of our storytelling about David? What does that say about how we picture or relate to David or any of the Bible heroes? Why do we start calling them heroes in the first place? And what does leaving these little notes out say about how we relate to God? Questions like this can be embarrassing because they go against the narrative that we like best about ourselves or our heroes or our God. But it's real. And more importantly, God chose to leave it in the Bible instead of just snipping that little part out. So what does that say? about God, about our heroes, about us. I think carefully on this July 4th holiday, carefully, I think one could preach a sermon on the parts of our history that we'd rather leave out. Mm. Now I say that carefully on purpose because this is the type of truth that easily shuts people's ears. Now, I am not talking about don't hurt feelings, don't offend anyone. I'm talking about the way we sometimes like to use the truth as a battering ram. Now, if you have children and you give them pool noodles, in 30 seconds, they're going to start <laughs> whacking each other with them. And as they're whacking each other, what are they going to do? 
they're going to be putting up their hands in defense. Same thing happens with the truth, folks. If you're whacking someone with the truth, what are they going to do? They're going to put up their defenses. I do not want you to couch the truth. I want you to say it in a way that can be heard, because this is a really important truth to hear. In 1 Samuel 7, Samuel warns the people that they will have a king who will love war more than he will love God's people. He will love conquering more than he will love God's will. Here, David really does love conquering, but as you read the text, the story doesn't have much of a problem with it. It ends, David got stronger and stronger because the God was with him. The real question of this text and of this sermon possibility, I think, is turned on us, and I'd phrase it a bit differently. What do we love more than we love God's truth? How do we desperately want Christianity to be seen by our friends and our neighbors And what do we sacrifice of God's truth in the process? Jerusalem was a city founded on bloodshed. Christianity, in many ways, is a religion founded on bloodshed, and not just the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our nation is a nation founded on bloodshed, some for righteous causes, some not so righteous. But the way that we best honor this religion, this nation, and our God is by telling all of the stories. David did become greater and greater, for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. But when David started preying on the vulnerable, such as Bathsheba, in just six chapters from now, God does not approve. So who are we really as a nation? Who are we really as Christians? What stories should be told and celebrated, and what stories should be told and lamented? There's room for both. Perhaps, dear listeners, July 4th is a beautiful time to begin to interweave both celebration and lament without sacrificing one for the other as we honor the stories that have brought us to where we are now. Hmm. That's where I think this text is kind of leading. Yeah, what a what a great sort of way to tie this particular text and the way that it's framed by the lectionary mm. into um, you know the moment that it's set in the lectionary, which is on American Independence Day. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it would be really fascinating um, if you don't know perhaps the um, sort of indigenous origins of where you happen mm-hmm. to be stationed in your, in your congregation, look those up. And wouldn't it be interesting to start a sermon on the, the conquering of Jerusalem with an acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples who have lived on the land where you're currently worshiping? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, if that's a, a polarizing thing in your community to do the honoring of the ancestors, I think a way you could do that is to find a story from that tradition that would lead into the text. So it'd be more a little more subtle, you know. If mm-hmm. you're in a community that is not polarized by it, then by all means do the acknowledgement. But if people are are um if it will close their ears because it's become a politicized issue, then do it in a different way. It doesn't mean you have to not do it, but find a story from that tradition and use that to open your sermon. And that will speak volumes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, awesome. This is uh, really insightful. Thanks so much, Rachel. Absolutely. All right, friends, that's going to bring us to the end of this week's episode. You can find all of our back episodes on the website, firstreadingpodcast.com. Uh, You can subscribe to us there, and you can also find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts, which, of course, First Reading is. Naturally. Naturally. All right, friends, we look forward to being with you next week. Until then, I'm Tim McNinch. And I'm Rachel Wren. Happy Fourth of July.